No. I got it. Okay. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Danielle. So good of you to join us today. Where are you based in California? I'm in the Valley in Calabasas. I came there for a teaching job at Sierra Canyon, I think in 2012, and I was only going to stay one year. <laughs> so I think that's 11 years now. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you teach there? Uh, I don't teach there anymore, but I've been a math and history teacher uh, for 19 years now. I was so much exposed to kids through swimming clinics and speaking to boys and girls clubs and lots of uh, school assemblies, especially a lot of uh, middle school kids do an Olympic theme kind of fair. Yeah. And so they bring me in. And I realized after 12 years of motivational speaking in corporate America, that I got more out of speaking to kids than I did to adults. And yeah. so that sort of led me into teaching and and uh, I did that for, yeah, 19 years. And so you're not teaching at all anymore? I'm helping out in the district as a sub. Right. And um, looking back to maybe a full-time position or moving into something like tutoring or uh, doing swim clinics, um, maybe some private lessons. I'm not really sure. I'm kind of at a stage right now where uh, in between, as you might say, yeah. So I'm working on some some next tentacles moving out there. Yeah, sounds good. Similar to me, I, I had a 25-year PE teaching career and I, I finished up at the end of 2021 and I've been sort of toying with the idea of what's happening. I'm doing a bit of swim coaching, a bit of podcasting, that kind of thing. But I, I, yeah. do, I do love working with kids and they are a joy, aren't they? They give you so much. They, they can be hard work as well, though. And I think my message resonates with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had talked just in the introduction personally about uh, social media and the role and effect of young kids. Mm -hmm. And my message is one of just really pain, uh, emotional pain as a kid growing up. Um, teased a lot for being skinny, never feeling like I was good enough, um, always kind of second fiddle. And I was able to use that to my advantage. And I think it's a really important lesson for kids because number one, they all feel um, not good enough or they all know what it's like to be socially ridiculed or not invited to the party. And, and um, so I've had a lot of good success with that. And the neat thing is, uh, you know, I'll get letters. There's a pile over here still um, that I need to get to with kids that say, you know, I went out for the school musical because I heard your story and it's those kind of things that, you know, make it feel like, you know, I made a difference and that's a good feeling. Yes. Yeah, I think everyone looks back at their own teaching, I mean, their own sort of schooling and remembers a teacher that made an impact on them. And you can still remember that person. They might, may not remember you, but I think teachers can make a really big impact. And obviously you have in your teaching career. Well, I remember my headmaster told me that I'm in thirds. There's a third of my class that loves my class and loves math. There's a third that sort of shrugs their shoulders and says, eh, he's okay. And then the other third says, no way. He's way too hard of a grader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've heard that before too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now let's get on to your swimming. Have you managed to get a swim in this week? I swam this morning, as a matter of fact. Excellent. I and swim three days a week. Three days a week. And yeah. where do you swim out of? Um, Conejo Valley Masters. Um, it's in Thousand Oaks, which is about a 20 minute drive. And I joined up with Nancy Reno and her crew when I came to LA for that first teaching job that I mentioned earlier. It was a very difficult time in my life. Um, just gone through a very difficult divorce that lasted about two years. And I left Hawaii where we had raised the kids and came to LA with uh, my two boys, uh, Nate and Luke, eventually. And uh, I was really in a difficult spot. Um, and one of the things that really helped moving to a new city was having a group to be able to go to and feel like you've got, you know, some people around you. Plus mm -hmm. the fact that Nancy, who's the, you know, the coach and leading the program, um, she had been divorced and really turned into quite a mentor for me. 
right. in uh, not only giving me exercise so that I could come home tired, but also giving me some really great advice. Um, and in that regard, um, master swimming was really a savior for me. I had stayed out of the pool for years after my Olympic experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Things with USA Swimming went from bad to worse and drove me out of the sport. And so part of why I went into teaching um, and uh, Nancy really helped heal a lot of the, the old wounds. Yeah, I'm so pleased to hear that because I, I hear that a lot from people in master swimming that they may have had that time out of the water after being a swimmer, you know, as an age grouper and, and obviously yourself as a very well, world renowned swimmer. Um, it, it's been able to help them heal whatever sort of hurt and disappointment they've had from that time by just bringing back the joy they have in going in the water and, and having that sort of familiarity with training. Is that the way you sort of feel about it? I was growing up, I was a three sport athlete. I would play water polo in the fall and then basketball would be in the, in the, you know, whatever winter and then um, swimming would be in the springtime. And so I always loved basketball. I played basketball as a kid and my road to the Olympics was somewhat different than most Olympians. I only swam three months a year until um, I got to high school. And then I was leaving the pool to play basketball in between the two seasons. And so I always loved basketball. And when swimming ended, that's where I went. And it was funny because um, I made a semi-pro team in Portland really? for the Multnomah Athletic Club. There were 16 guys picked and I got picked 16. Wow. And so in our last, I didn't play at all because these some of these guys have been drafted by the NBA. Most of them played in Europe. They were really good players. Mm -hmm. And so I sat on the bench the whole season. And the last game, a lot of the players didn't show up. And so I got some playing time. In fact, I got to start the game. And in the first two series, I had a three-point shot and a breakaway dunk. And the other team called a timeout. It came over and the coach says, I don't know what to tell you guys, but the swimmer has all the points. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and then my back went out. And I remember the doctor telling me, in the future, you need to exercise. You know, mm -hmm. two weeks maybe of laying up low. But eventually the healing comes from movement and strengthening the cores and not from just lying with your, with your feet up. And he says, you got two choices. You can cycle or you can swim. And I thought, how ironic. <laughs> and on the big island, a lot of cyclists are killed every year. You know, they have the, tri the Ironman there. Yep. And there's no shoulder. There's no place for cyclists. And a lot of them get picked off. Wow. So I thought, I guess I better go back to the pool. And yes. that's been 21 years now. Oh, well, that's good. Master Swimming is happy to have you, believe me. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't like competing anymore. Yep. It's really um, quite depressing yes. when I used to swim 100 meters under 49 seconds. <laughs> and now you can time me with a sundial. It seems. Oh, I'm sure it's not like that. <laughs> what, what could you throw down for 100 free now? Um, see, a couple years ago when I really went for it, I went at 54. 54.0. That's amazing. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. good for my, for my age. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, you had such a remarkable career as an Olympian. And I really wanted to talk about that with 11 Olympic gold medals. Oh, sorry, 11 Olympic medals, eight of them gold. Can you share with us some of the moments that meant the most to you throughout that journey over 84, 88, 92 Olympics? Sure. Um, I guess I alluded to a little bit of the social ridicule that I had as a kid. Um, my dad used to call me the human one iron because I look like a golf club standing sideways with my big 14 size feet. Um, and so I went to the 84 trials on the recommendation that my coach said, you know, just go and watch and you'll get valuable experience. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't expect to make the team. And it was so um, fortunate because I remember the day of the competition, you'd see the swimmers in the ready room or you know, just around the pool trying to be comfortable getting ready for their race. And they're white as goats. You could just see the fear in their eyes. And I know what it's like. You know, you've been training 15 years for this moment. And in some cases you have a minute or less or maybe two yeah. minutes. Yeah. And for the United States, as with Australia, I'm sure, um, it's that field of eight is a tough competition. 
Mm. So, and I went into it just totally blind, just a dumb kid. I had no idea what was going on. I swam and I made the finals and uh, in lane seven and uh, Robin Leaney was in lane six, uh, UCLA sprinter, fastest man in the world at the time uh, before the world record was recognized in the 50. And I actually had his picture on my wall when I was uh, in high school for inspiration. Um, and he was next to me in lane six. And of course he's a sprinter. So I just sort of tried to hang with him as best I could. We turned and I started to catch him. And as I got to the halfway mark coming home, I looked across the pool and I could see all the way to lane one. Wow. And it totally freaked me out because I mentally wasn't ready to win that race, but I was definitely in there. Yeah. And, um, it really was a moment of how the physical body and the mental body have to be in the same. And my mind wasn't there. I didn't see myself as a champion yet. And I finished fourth, but that got me on the relay. And then LA was just the same thing. I had no idea what was going on. Um, Rowdy Gaines was my roommate and I trained with him and I sort of just fell under his wing and said that, uh, you know, whatever he did, I did. So I had to, I had to be on the right track. And of course our relay, we, we won world record. Um, I had a, a good solid swim, um, gave Rowdy the lead from coming from behind. And uh, so that led to my college water polo and swimming, which ended in 88. I graduated that May of 88. And of course we had the trials just uh, another month away and so 88 was very different because um, some guy by the name of Mark Spitz had won seven gold medals in one Olympics and set seven world records. And so when I qualified for seven events, that was what the press kept pushing was, are you going to be Mark Spitz? And I'm like, well, the world is different now. I mean, Mark yeah. left most of his competition at home when he went to the Olympics, taking one and two. And, you know, I got beat by Anthony Nesty from Suriname for crying out loud. I mean, I know he trained in Florida and uh, Randy Reese put him on the podium, one of our U.S. coaches, but still, and we just didn't have that pool back then. And so I finished with seven medals and I felt that that was a great accomplishment. And I'll tell you that my first medal in the 200 free was bronze. And I was so excited, my first individual medal, and I was on the podium and I really felt good. Yep. And ironically, the bronze medal is the most spectacular. When you look at the three different medals, the bronze really? shows more of the relief uh -huh. and the detail because they're quite, they're pieces of art, really. Yes. And, you know, that, a lot of sculpture is made from bronze because it shows all the, the finite detail. So here I am with my bronze medal and we come back to the, the village where all the athletes and being the first swim and the first medal, everybody kind of in the lobby came around. And I pulled it out and they wanted to see it and hold it. And it was this really great moment. And then in the corner was an NBC recap of the race. And so Bob Costas comes on after the race. Here's all that hype about Matt Biondi and seven gold medals. And Bob Costas says, well, Matt Biondi has failed to eclipse Mark Spitz's record of seven gold medals, had to settle for the bronze. We'll be back after these messages. And the whole like lift of the room they all turned to me and just said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I actually wrote him several letters, like, who the hell are you to call me a failure? Yeah. You know, that's ridiculous. Absolutely. And he never really copped up to it. He did come back later on and say some nice things about my future. But that sort of leads into the pressure that the media puts on mm -hmm. you, that mm -hmm. you have to be always superlative. And if you're not, then they drag you down. Yeah. And as a good message is that, you know, you just got to go out there and do your best and please mm -hmm. the people that love you and care about you. Mm -hmm. And the rest is just noise. And it really is true. It doesn't matter what they say about you as long as they spell your name right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, getting a bronze medal at the Olympics is an amazing feat. And that race, I remember it particularly, it was a, a great race between you and, and Duncan Armstrong from Australia. Yeah. You, you got the gold and you both swam so beautifully. And I thought that was a great way to set off your amazing Olympics. What about the, the five gold that followed? How did you feel about those? 
Well, you forget that the next one I lost by a hundredth of a second to Anthony Nesty, right. leading the whole way ahead of world record. And what a lot of people don't know is I didn't swim butterfly in, in the competition pool. Our polo coach used to punish us swimming butterfly, but always short distance. Right. So I never developed a bad stroke. And in 88, when I was such a good shape, I could pull off a hundred meter butterfly. And so I led the whole way, but I totally choked on the finish. Right. Three long strokes instead of the appropriate four shorter ones. And I lost by a hundredth of a second. So if you look at the thickness of your fingernail, yes. that's it. And then of course, Biondi has failed again. Oh. So I remember going in, I still had another swim that night to anchor our 800 free relay. Yep. And I remember being like, okay, you got to bear down just one time, one time show the world what you can do. And if you do that once, then you can go home and hold your head high. Mm -hmm. And so then we won the relay and then came the hundred, um, not my best time, but good enough for an Olympic record, another gold yes. medal, um, our free relay, we, we rocked it took it, took another gold. And then it was the 50 that really set things off when I was able to beat Tom, which didn't always happen. You know, Tom won most of the races that we competed against, a fierce competitor. Yeah. Um, and then our medley relay. So I ended up after a disappointing bronze and silver, I ended up with five <laughs> golds to finish off. And Bob Costas, I loved it when he got pink eye and he had to do the whole broadcast with pink eye. It made me feel so good. <laughs> sweet revenge <laughs> yes hi and, there Bob can you see okay <laughs> and and how about the Barcelona Olympics that was your your final Olympics how yeah you, you know yeah. um that was really an unfortunate situation for myself mm. and for the future of swimming mm. because Tom and I were really on the cusp of bringing modern swimming to the United States we were still under the amateur model. Um, Don Scholander almost got sanctioned because he accidentally kept a business coat from one of the photo shoots. And, you know, go back in history, gal has a glass of champagne on the ship going over there and she's sent home. I mean, that whole model of love of country doing it because um, you value the sport and not willing to financially support your athletes. And when Tom and I started to make money, both in our own speedo or arena contracts, um, but also in our match races, we were getting prize money, appearance mm -hmm. money and prize money. And that totally blew US swimming away. They did everything they could to keep me from the limelight, to keep me out of the press. I had to train by myself. I really? couldn't hire a coach. I actually asked Eddie Reese, who mm -hmm. was the head men's Olympic coach for the 92 Olympics in 1989, Three years earlier, I called him up and I said, I'm homeless. I need a coach. You're the Olympic coach. Let me come to Austin and train with you. Mm -hmm. He said, let me see. Call me back the next day and said, no. Well, why? So I had that, uh, because he had loyalty to college. Right. And Sean Jordan, who was another, you know, um, he actually made the alternate on the relay. And I think it's so small minded because if Sean and I had trained together, yeah. Maybe he would have been on the relay. Maybe I could have helped him instead of trying to mm. keep your proprietary interest to yourself. It's very selfish mm. and unfortunate because he was the leader of our Olympic team and he shut the door on me. And U.S. Mm. Swimming did. And in fact, Ray Essick, um, about six months before he passed away, apologized and admitted that because I was with Arena and Speedo was a national team sponsor, Right. that Speedo actively told USA Swimming to restrict Matt Biondi from his, his pursuits. So I was over in Bonn, Germany for an arena sprint series. And I was in shape and ready to compete. And I got a fax from USA Swimming the day of the competition and said, if I participated, I would lose my Olympic eligibility. And it was all money. Right. It was all money from Speedo to try to keep Arena and Matt out of this, the limelight. And so after 92, I flipped him the bird and it was awful. Yeah, it was that's... totally unfortunate. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's now, a sad look, way. look at what professional sports have done today. I know. Look at how far swimming has come. Yeah. And everything that we pushed for was the absolute right thing to do. Absolutely. But they weren't ready for it. And we were the yeah. bad boys. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a sad way that you had to finish your finish your Olympic career in that way. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. It was just awful. Yeah. Well, let's flip it to a, a brighter note. Talk about the, a bit about your experience of the World Championships where you had a lot of success as well and you broke the 50-metre world record three times and the 100-metre four times. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the good experiences from, from that time? Well, obviously, you know, when you, when you, ex, you know, meet or exceed your, your goals, um, it's, it's amazing feedback and it really just feeds that you're on a good path and, um, yeah, you're making a positive impact. Um, conversely, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Mm. I, I think the message that I give kids is just more of persistence. Um, and then once you hit that high mark, then you got to log it away and keep it as a as a, a keepsake because it doesn't always it doesn't always happen that way uh, yeah. but i was very fortunate to um have some great swims uh, i was six seven i got big hands um kind of smaller bones so i remember um being on the football field for one of the 49er games and um joe montana and roger craig and uh, dwight clark and all the big stars were coming out first. And they looked at me and they go, hey, you're the swimmer, aren't you? And then Montana looks at me and says, well, if we can put on 60 pounds, we might make a tight end out of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lineman, right? For the rugby yeah. players over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was too wispy. <laughs> so just physically, I had you know a great model uh, for, for being in the water. And yep. I was really driven by um, a lot of social ridicule when I was young. And I think, you know, uh, Phelps had a similar experience with dyslexia and some um, bouncing around schools, uh, you know, maybe a not so great relationship with his dad. Um, and I think every sports celebrity, Michael Jordan getting cut from his middle school basketball team. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what makes champions is to be resilient and to be able to take those painful feelings, emotional feelings, and turn them into something positive. And if you can do that, then it's really quite inspiring as a human being to know that, you know, whatever, whatever life brings you, you know, you can deal with it. It may not be comfortable for a, a quite a while, but once you get over it and hit that mark, you just need to do it once. And then you see that yeah. path and it's, uh, it's a great feeling. Looking back at that time during those three Olympics, did you let yourself feel joy at those successes then or did you wait until your career was over I know it ended on a bit of a sour note for you but do you look back at it now and think how amazing that was I mean if that was done right now you would be a worldwide celebrity you are a worldwide celebrity but you would be yeah. because of social media you would be in everyone's the forefront of everyone's mind Sure. Uh, you know, I think about what it would be like if I had done what I did in in the current modern era. Mm. Um, for example, USA Swimming gave me twelve thousand dollars for seven Olympic medals and five gold medals. Wow! And can you imagine what that would be equivalent to today? I mean, it was yes. also an, insulting. I turned around and, and donated all the money back to Berkeley, where I got a where they gave me a full scholarship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought on that one. Yeah, Maybe that's, that's a good. A... <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, I was just wondering whether you reflected at the time that it was such a, a mm. such a, a monumental thing that you were doing, or whether you you more so do that now. Did you let yourself feel that? Joy yeah, then? I think much yeah. more later. Um, yeah. I remember one moment in Seoul. Um, swimming seven events, which was 11 times in the eight days. Mm. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have semifinals then. So That's we just right. had trials and finals. So that made it yep. quite a bit easier. But there was always, you know, once one race was over, then you were right into the next race before you could, you know, as soon as the medal ceremony was over. It was neat walking around the stadium with the medals and the fanfare and waving. Yep. But it was like, a, it, to be honest, it was like um, a, a, a movie set. And someone was going to say, cut, you know, okay, go back. Or, you know, someone was going to say, hey, you don't belong here. Get out of here. It was always a part of me that was like, is this real? Right. Am I, is this really happening? 
it was hard to kind of just settle in. But once everything was over, I remember going back to the hotel room after my last swim in Seoul. And I sat on the bed and I just sort of fell back and I just couldn't believe what had just happened and that it was all over and that I had done well and that no one could take it away from me. Yeah. And it was in the books. Yeah. And that was really the first time that I appreciated and really got to kind of put my head around what I had accomplished. And it still goes on today. I mean, I'm not a superstar. In fact, most people question the fact that I'm Matt Biondi because, you know, my hair is quite a bit different <laughs> than it used to be. Um, I lost a little bit of the, the neck and the big shoulders and all that. Um, but I was at the lumber yard. And I was looking through the timbers, trying to find ones that were straight. And there was another gentleman on the other side. And so, you know, we were doing the same thing. So he's at one end, I'm at the other, and we're moving the boards. And he goes, hey, are you Matt Biondi? And I said, well, yeah, I am. And he goes, you did really well for our country. Damn proud to meet you. Oh, and that's that lovely. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. so nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Then that still goes on today. Or if that's I pay with a credit card. That kind of thing. They'll say, yeah. oh, Biondi, were you an Olympian? Were you the one that hit your head on the diving board? <laughs> oh, that was Greg Luganus. Greg Luganus. Same <laughs> Olympics, but different guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was terrible. I remember saying that. It was, yeah. yeah, and remember, there was no uh, AIDS protocol back then. Yeah. If you see, they, they dressed his wound just with a bare hand. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, you were the first man under 49 seconds for the 100 free. And that was an amazing feat at the time. How did you, did you change your training before that to get under that? How did you first get under that? What, did, what strategy did you use in the race? Well, the key was really the 200 to okay. train for the 200. And that made the 100 just seem like a sprint. Yep. And just psychologically to be able to get off the blocks and, and know exactly what I was doing. And I think I was undefeated in big competition for maybe eight years. I mean, nobody beat me. Yep. Tom beat me in the 50. Pablo beat me in the butterfly. Michael Gross beat me in the 200. But nobody beat me in the, in the 100. I was just built for it. Yes. And so I had a lot of confidence. And my fastest, uh, the 48.4 at the trials, um, I, had, I had swum the 200, set American record. I had swam the butterfly, finished first. You know, it was like the second time I ever swam it. And I won the Olympic trials. And the third event was the 100 free. And there was one moment that I can share. I'm a pretty modest guy. I mean, I don't have my, my again, my medals are donated to the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame in Chicago. Right. So that they can be on display. And despite a few of these really gorgeous NCAA awards that are behind me, I don't have any swimming you wouldn't know I was a swimmer if you yep. if you came in into my to my home um I forgot my train of thought again we'll have to edit that what was the question <laughs> um you were talking about how your 200 training helped oh, yeah, 100 yeah. world record yep okay the key to the 100 free for me was really swimming the 200 mm -hmm. and also dropping down to the 50 um, I got beat in the 50, Jager quite frequently. Uh, Pablo beat me in the butterfly. Uh, yeah. Michael Gross in the 200 free, along with uh, Sven Lotevsky. And, and, uh, and so the 100 was really my, my specialty. I felt like I was, was confident in that race. And so yeah. when I swam my fastest time, 48.4, was at the trials in Austin. And I had swum the 200 previously set American record. So I knew my training was good. Um, the butterfly, my second time ever, I won the Olympic trials, uh, beat Pablo for the first time. And then the third event was the 100 free. And I knew that I was gonna tear it up. I just had an amazing amount of confidence. And I'm a pretty modest guy. Um, you wouldn't know it from being in my home. I have a few of my college awards, primarily because they're just really pretty awards. They're gorgeous. Um, so I'm a pretty modest guy. But in we walked into the ready room for the 100 swim, for the 100 meter swim for the, the 88 trials. 
And when I got there, the other seven guys looked at me and I swear they all said the same thing in their head, which was Matt here, Matt's here. Now we're swimming for second. Right. And when I walked out onto the pool deck, you know, there was, you know, five, 7,000 people there. I could almost hear individual voices like go Sean, go Tom, go Matt. It was really quite strange. Wow. And when I dove in, I remember just sort of like being above my body, like not really in it, not really feeling any of my, my movements. And I hit the one turn. And as I looked over, the field was still coming in. They hadn't hit the wall yet. And I was already pushing off. Yep. So there's a half body length, three quarter body length lead right now. And many of the coaches responded that when I came up, they've never seen a swimmer come out so high in the water. Maybe that's not a good thing. Um, but it was just an amazing swim where I felt no pain until maybe the last three strokes. Yeah. And that was, that was really the highlight of my athletic. It was the, the best swim that I ever had. And it was really about challenging myself outside the 100 and the 200 free and the 50 free yep. that made the 100 so good. And it's interesting, there's really not been a lot of folks who do the 50 and the 200. Right. anymore uh yep. yeah popovich maybe is the closest with the 100 and the 200 mm -hmm. but yep. my college record stood for 20 some years my ncaa record yes um just because they didn't they didn't swim that breath um afterwards yes. it was all just 50 and 100 i think ncaa changed their scholarship and events to allow more sprinters to come in and that sort of weighted the the recruiting class towards the faster events and away from the longer ones that's a pity isn't it because those middle distance <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> the middle distance um or 200 is a, a great addition to your program and it's obviously helped helped your 100 as you said yeah yeah no the you know variety events but then again there's a saying that those <laughs> that can sprint sprint and those that can't swim distance <laughs> <laughs> and there's a certain truth to that yeah because for the events that are you know especially the 50 the flash you know dive and splash and dash um those are just really exciting and for example when tom and i would swim against each other in the championship um nobody was in the bathroom nobody was getting concessions nobody was out on a phone call I mean, it was one of the premier events of the night and you could hear, you know, the, the fan, the, it was, the stands would start pumping and just cheer and the whole, the whole uh, elevation would come up. So those were fun, fun times. Yeah. Do you, the way that you trained back then for those events, do you think that it's different to the way they're, they're training now from what you Oh, know? absolutely. And yeah. the simplest way to, to explain it, I think, is that we used to do this mountain, um, design where you build yardage build yardage until you're totally worn down um i'm not sure i needed to swim ten thousand meters a day to swim the 200 i don't know that that i don't think any sprinters are doing that now no. but then the idea is once you come down off the slope then your body responds and you have all this energy and away you go and the difference now is i think you train like you want to compete there's no sloppy swimming like i mentioned earlier with my butterfly I was just always on top of the water and learned to swim butterfly the absolute correct way. Yep. Um, and so on a, you know, more modern training schedule, if an athlete doesn't feel it, and believe me, we all have those days, you shut her down. You don't just grind through it. You just keep a very high standard in the pool, in the training pool. And of course, now they do a lot more um, core work. There's a lot yes. more dry land. I know yep. my son, Nate, uh, swam at Berkeley and I was vicariously following his training schedule and they they do a lot more out of the pool mm. out of the pool training which i think is is really you know important and then of course the big difference is the underwater swimming yes. you know burkoff uh just introduced that and he used to swim the whole way underwater it was before fina outlawed the rules he'd take mm. three strokes in a 50 meter pool yeah. and then stay under uh, over half i mean and what was so ironic is that fina said it's not exciting because you can't see the swimmer. But when he would pop up, you know, this whole field in this empty lane and he would pop up, oh boy, the crowd went wild. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely did. <laughs> it was like a submarine coming out from the depths. <laughs> exactly. 
if if you were swimming now, do you think you'd focus more on the fifty and the hundred, or would you you go towards the hundred and the two hundred? Oh, <laughs> I'd laugh at that because <laughs> I uh, I I know I wouldn't do any of it. I I really enjoy just training. Yeah, um, I'm, I, c- competition is is um, I don't look forward to it. Um, it's just hard for me to you know now like I swim. 100 yards in 41 seconds and now i feel good if i can break a minute i mean it's kind of depressing in a way <laughs> um, my last meet in december i decided to swim the 400 meters okay. uh, because i'd never swum it before so what does that mean i was guaranteed to have a personal best time it's the best yeah <laughs> yeah that's right first time as a master swimmer why'd you get a best time well it's the first time i swam the event <laughs> With your with your master swimming, I know that you started the Matt Beyond Matt Beyondy Masters Classic from the pool that you train at. Tell us a little bit how how that came to be, and is that still going now? And do you enter it yeah. yourself? Yeah. Well, obviously, we had a little slowdown with COVID, like mm. the rest of the world. Yeah. But uh, we're getting ready for our eighth annual uh, nice. coming up in March, and as I mentioned earlier. When I joined the Masters, the Caneo Valley Masters, uh, the head coach there, Nancy, was more than a coach. Um, she was just a really good friend. And so she approached me and said, you know, would you be willing to put your name on a, on a meet for a fundraiser for the club? Yep. And of course, you know, I agreed. And, um, and so we've been, we've been doing it every year that we could. And it's yep. a great fundraiser for the club. A lot of people like it because Nancy does more than just the swim meet. Um, the first year, they, you know, you could print your own T-shirts. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a raffle with lots of really nice donated items, you know, beautiful baskets, wine kits and pottery mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, sports memorabilia. So you can, you know, they're raffling things off during the day. And, and it's just a great, it's, it's a, I think people, we get maybe a little over 200. I think our high water mark was 275 okay. number of swimmers. Yep. So it's a, it's a great event and it helps the club and we all, have to chip in in our own way. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah. And is that run over short course yards or meters? Yeah. Yeah. I know crazy Americans, we're the only ones that swim stupid yards. <laughs> but yeah, we're still counting inches and feet yeah. and all that ridiculous stuff. <laughs> when I was a kid in middle school, I remember seeing a video and this guy got pulled over because the, the sign said 99 kilometers an hour. Well, that equates to 55 miles an hour. Here in the states but he thought it was so that was the whole i mean in the 70s they wanted to convert and here we are <laughs> still still with the old system yeah <laughs> and have you done much coaching of master swimmers yourself or has that been really just younger swimmers that you've worked with well in truth i'm i'm sort of like a habitual coach <laughs> i can't help but look at swimmers under the water and so I mean, today, a uh, guy I swim with, Don, uh, he's just lightning quick. Uh, he's a few years older than me. Um, and, you know, for a 50, you can't, you can't leave him behind. He's amazing. But after a 50, it just sort of goes downhill from there. And he, he cuts his, his stroke short. He doesn't finish all the way. There's not a lot of roll. He's really flat. And so I'm watching him and I'm like, hey, Don, can I, can I just give you a little piece of advice? He's like, sure. So I do that with the swimmers on our team. And then uh, there's a couple kids in the area who go to the local high school where my daughter goes to. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've agreed to help them out, you know, not often, once every two weeks or so, we'll get in the pool and I'll look at them and give them some suggestions. Yeah. Um, but I haven't coached um, really on a formal basis uh, since I left teaching. And of yes. course, as a teacher, I was uh, coaching the middle school and high school swim programs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, funny, that leads me into a funny little story. I don't know whether whether you know that I had Becky, um, your teammate, master's teammate on the podcast a few weeks ago. And she oh, yeah. met, she mentioned that she had heard um, another, another guest mentioned the Beyondy fly drill. And she said that she told you about it and you'd never ever heard of the Beyondy fly drill. <laughs> so I just wanted to know from you, do you know where that originated? Because I know that coaches all over Australia give the Beyondy fly drill. Huh. I didn't even know what it is. You guys will have to tell me. 
<laughs> it's a one Do I get any royalties for that? Is there like any compensation for you trademark need, infringement? You need or something? to. You definitely need to. <laughs> <laughs> it's the yeah. one where you have your arm at the front. You do one. You do two butterfly arm strikes on on that side. You do two in the middle with both, and then you do two on that side. Honestly, I've never done that drill in my whole never life. Never done that drill. I never heard never of it. Done. Well, you need to be getting you need to be getting some royalties. This is rumor started by Duncan Armstrong. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> That's payback. Payback for it. <laughs> so, what what do you do as your butterfly drill? If we were going to, um, I try to stay name... away from butterfly as much as possible. Uh, okay. Um, it it doesn't feel as good for me. I had um, problems with my lung, right? Um, and so I had some surgery, and it really kind of changed everything up front. Um, I enjoy swimming freestyle and backstroke yep. and not so much butterfly. I'll swim a 25 or they do an IM kind yep. of thing, but no, to no, turn and go back the other way, butterfly doesn't happen anymore. Well, yeah, in fact, somebody, <laughs> somebody approached me to get our um, 88 medley relay together for the Olympic trials in Indianapolis coming up next year. Nice. And I was all excited until I realized, hey, wait a minute, I swam butterfly on that relay. <laughs> <laughs> no. no way am I doing that. <laughs> Maybe they could get the freestyle one together rather than the medley. Yeah, well, I think it's because uh, um, Richard Schroeder is is there. He was our breaststroker, and David Burkoff has been coaching and involved in swimming. His daughter is really tearing it up. She's yeah, a I saw that. Yeah, national team member. Yeah. and so then um, then I had to fill in butterfly. So oh, that's not happening. <laughs> Maybe so, I could do my Beyondy drill. You could do your Beyondy drill. You could do one stroke, right. two strokes. <laughs> Ooh, they whistle. Get them out of here. So if you were going to create the new Beyondy drill, let's make it a freestyle one. What's your favorite freestyle drill that you do in training these days? Because you have I, a you know, the biggest, freestyle. The biggest thing for me is roll. Right. A lot of swimmers swim like tugboats and their bodies are really pl plain in the water, pushing a lot of water. Yep. And to be able to roll on your side and get your profile more like you're balanced on a rail and, and not as much just plowing through the water. That, that is a really um, a, a big point for me. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly um, the biggest sort of um, faux pas or crime in swimming are the elbows, low elbows. Um, you see it all the time in master swimmers, it, partly because of flexibility. Flexibility. You know, some of these older gentlemen that uh, were um, marathon runners or track, I mean, their ankles just don't flex. Yes. It's a 90 degree angle the whole time. And when they kick, you know, they, they go backwards because they, so flexibility in masters is a big thing and it makes it hard to get the elbows up. But yep. I really encourage uh, rolling and a more efficient pull because it makes swimming more enjoyable. Right. It shouldn't be a struggle at times. You should be able to just be able to relax. And like you're walking with a friend down the street and talking at the same time. You're not worried about what your legs are doing. You're not worried about being out of breath. You're just enjoying company and the sunshine and the fresh air. And swimming can be like that. Yeah. But, you know, um, beginning to moderate level swimmers swim one length and they get to the other end. <laughs> right. And it's just yeah. because they need to be more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What about your favorite um, training set that you do for freestyle? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what my, um, what, from my younger days, mm -hmm. uh, my high school coach, Stu Khan, called it breakthroughs. And okay. every Wednesday we did starting off with 10 100s for time on four minutes from a dive. And all the times are recorded. And he had a bar chart that he kept up on the pool deck with all of our times. And so the next week we would do nine and then eight, and then we would come down. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that your overall average would also come down as far as time. And it was such an intense set because, you know, with four minutes apart, there's waves every minute going off of eight guys and the pool just, <laughs> <laughs> and you're over there, you know, it's like, oh man, two more minutes. And so your whole week, literally your whole week was based around Wednesday. 
Wow. Wednesday's coming. It's Monday. Here come two, two tomorrow's Wednesday. And then oh, practice. And then when it's over, tomorrow, Thursday is the greatest amount of time between now and Wednesday. <laughs> but it was a mentally challenging set and obviously physically um, really great for training. So that, that was the most um, intense set I remember as a high school kid. And I did it with my high school kids. And they'll yeah. say the same thing. Yeah. The whole week revolved around Wednesday. Right. Now, um, a set that I'm quite fond of that's challenging is alternating. Uh, so we do a 50 easy and then a 150 fast and then a 50 easy and then 250s fast and then a 50 easy 350s, a 50 easy 450s fast, um, like at 200 pace uh, right. for each of the 50s. So we're yep. sprinting on short rest yep. um, for the fast ones. And then we get a long, easy swim in between and then we come down four, three, two, one on the fast ones. And it takes about 30 minutes. And by the end, um, you know, the, we did this set, I think on Monday and I had to sit in my car for a few minutes <laughs> just <laughs> to drink some water and, you know, just kind of like, okay, I got to drive home now. I mean, it was, it was intense. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, master swimmers is funny because to most master swimmers, a hard workout is how far you went, mm -hmm. how many yards did you go? Yeah. But those are the easiest practices for me because mm -hmm. I just get in that loop, loop, loop mode, and you know, it's the hard workouts are when you're on your horse going yeah. hard, and your lungs are burning, and your legs are seizing up, and you know, that's that's really, and a lot of master swimmers don't like that because yeah. they don't know how to swim at different degrees, mm -hmm. right? They don't have that intensity from their experience. So everything is sort of the same, yeah. but if they can learn to swim easy and long at times, but then, you know, let's go, yeah. get, it, get it on. Let's show, show me what you got. Yeah. Great advice. I think for all those master swimmers out there. Absolutely. Tell me, this is a bit of an out there question, but tell me if you were going to create a, um, a dream relay of freestylers right now, but include yourself in it, and you can have the freestyle from any era that you want. Who would you put on that relay with yourself as the anchor? Well, <laughs> um, I guess I would have to do or invite those swimmers who I had the most respect for. Yeah. And what I mean, you know, when you're a fast swimmer, that's one thing. And everybody mm -hmm. respects that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't enough for me. Um, I got to know uh, Michael Gross, Stefan Carone. Tom Jager outside the pool. Mm. Um, and those, they were, they really uh, helped me to see that swimming was important, but life was, was even more important. And there are things, you know, we racing across the top of the water faster than anybody else. You know, it's not curing cancer. It's not helping the sick. It, it's, it's not um, improving our environment. It's just kind of an entertainment thing. And those three gentlemen were close friends and we ate together in big events uh, outside of swimming, mm -hmm. um, had lots of laughter. Um, I visited Germany several times and France on Michael and Stefan's invitation. And Tom and I actually owned part of a ranch together in Colorado. We used to go oh, really? camping out there. Yeah. Um, many years ago, but yeah, we we're good times. So nowadays I might not pick the fastest swimmers, but I'd pick the ones I'd enjoyed the most. <laughs> yeah. I love that answer. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, I don't Matt, know about being an anchor. That's a little too much for me now. No, no. I meant back in, you know, back in those days when you were swimming where you wanted to be swimming. That's I can just dream, mail in my dream time. Really. Okay, yeah. You can ma that. mail in your time, mail in your time. You, <laughs> you have to be your own anchor. That's for sure. <laughs> Matt, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been sure. absolutely amazing speaking to you and, um, Wishing you every success with everything coming up in your future. Great. Likewise. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.